Welcome to Summit Community Church. We are so glad you're with us. We want to connect with you during the service, so feel free to post your comments in the live chat section. If you're watching us for the first time, our Summit family would love to get to know you. Tell us where you're tuning in from. As well, you can head over to the Summit website and click on New Here to find our connection card. One of our team members would love to connect with you. You'll also be able to listen to the sermon in English or Farsi. You'll find those messages on our site as well. At Summit, we have all kinds of different opportunities to grow together, stay connected, and serve in our community. For full details on all that's going on at Summit, check out our website, summitcommunity.ca. So go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you can get all the latest updates here on YouTube. And don't forget to like this video. Let's worship together this morning. Take it away, worship team. Lord, I come. I confess about when here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you oh I Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sin runs deep, your grace is more, but grace is is where you are, where you are, Lord, I am free, a holiness is Christ in me. You're my hope and stay
in full. This is a life full of abundance and Isaiah describes it in Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. Let's pray together, church. Father, we come before you this morning and our hearts are open wide at your glorious gifts of grace in your son, Jesus. We praise you and we thank you that out of your great love, you gave your son for us. And Jesus, how could we ever thank you for the gift that you gave of coming that we would know God through your life, that you would sacrifice for us, that you would die upon a cross for our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, 
Jesus, you rose again. You ascended on high. You are greatly to be praised. We thank you. You are above all things. There is no other name. And you take us from these places into beautiful spaces. In you, there is transformation. In you, the old is new. In you, there is new life. We thank you that you saved us. You are a God who forgives our sins and heals us and restores us and redeems us out of abundance. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we praise you this morning. We thank you for this beautiful opportunity to sit under your word and to learn from you. And we pray that as you speak your truth through Kevin this morning, that you would um, radically transform our thinking, that you would change our hearts, that we would become in increasing amounts more and more like you, that we would be holy as you are holy that we would love like you. Jesus, in this service today, as your word touches our ears, we know that your word goes out around this world, in churches around this world. We think of our sister church, the well. And we just ask that you bless them with this same abundance of all that you are today their leadership, their elders, their staff, their body, that you would continue to encourage them and build into them, that they would be growing more and more like you, Jesus, and that they would be sent, that they would go, that they would make disciples, and that they would share your good news. And we know that from the north to the south, to the east to the west, that you send your people, that your good news would travel this earth. We think of how many people you have in different regions all over. Some we know, some we don't, and we just ask you that this day that you would strengthen them and that you would fill them with your word, that they would proclaim you boldly, that you would be glorified all upon the earth in every way. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Summit Community Church, and a special good morning to all of you who are at our watch party today. So glad to be worshiping together with you. We are continuing our sermon series called Inspired Jesus, Our Joy, which is a study in the book of Philippians. Now, throughout Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, he exhorts the believers to what? To rejoice, to have joy, to show joy. He does that by describing his own joy to them. He shares his joy with them. And not only that, he invites them into his joy. And of course, our hope is that you will come to know the biblical basis for Christian joy and the many ways that you can cultivate and experience it in your life with Christ and in your life with other believers. Now, if you would remember from last week, we told you that Christian joy is rooted in the past and looks to the future. Christian joy is rooted in the past and looks to the future. And we couch this in the Jewish foundation story of the Jews being enslaved in Egypt and delivered by God um, from that scenario. And that was the central foundation story for them. Now, of course, as Christians, we too look to that foundation story as part of our history. But we also look to, of course, the gospel as our foundation story. Jesus' incarnation his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and the fact that he will return one day. And this is all encapsulated very nicely in the Apostles' Creed, which you might know. I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, uh, God the Father Almighty, and his Son, his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified dead and buried, and he rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven, 
and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. So we see that um, this resurrection story of Christ is where our Uh, Our joy is rooted, looking into the past, but also recognizing that Jesus is yet to come. Rooted in the Christmas story and looks to the hope of the once and for all fulfillment of the Easter story when Jesus comes again. Now, speaking of the Christmas story, I read this blog post by T.M. Suffield where he was talking about this wonderful phrase in the midst of the birth narrative of Jesus where the Magi, the wise men, have journeyed from the east in search of this newly born king of the Jews. And when they saw the star, having reached Mary and Joseph and beheld baby Jesus, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now that's quite the description of joy, wouldn't you say? They rejoiced, but not only did they rejoice, they rejoiced exceedingly. But not only rejoiced exceedingly, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. As I was reading this, it it, it made me think of something. It sounded like something that uh, Jane Austen would have penned. And I began to think for myself, when was the last time in my life in Christ, when was the last time that the the, uh, engendering of so great a superlative, a response to joy? Now, I don't know, because it's been a long time. And I wonder if you would think the same thing. When was the last time your life in Christ engendered such a superlative response? of joy. Now, Suffield, thinking about it for himself, I think, shares a list of things that helps him develop joy. And as he describes it, um, joy as turning his heart towards Jesus, looking to the past and hope in the future, uh, and praising him. So this is where he starts. He says, you can develop joy by gathering with the assembled church. Now, some of you are doing that right now at the watch party. You can partake in the Lord's Supper. Now, we're going to do that as well in a moment, but this is a collective communal act that uh, the gathered people of God can do together. This is something that would help us develop joy in Christ. We can pray with others. This is an important uh, aspect of developing joy. If, uh, If you haven't had an opportunity to pray with others for some time, I invite you to join our Sunday morning prayers at 9 a.m. The link is on our website. You can share a meal with others. Finally, we're out of lockdown. You can, you know, invite someone into your home or go to a restaurant and share a meal with others. That is a way to develop your joy. You can study the Word of God with others and discuss it together. Uh, The young adults are right now going through uh, Psalm 23 together. They're studying it and discussing it. Um, You can read the Bible out loud. This will develop joy. Uh, I love listening to uh, the Bible read to me, but also reading it out loud. I just feel like there's something different about it. When, uh, as I've been preparing this series in Philippians, I have been reading Philippians every day, uh, either reading it uh, out loud to myself or listening to the, um, the Bible app that I have that can read it out to me. Uh, I would highly encourage you to do that as we are studying the book of Philippians. Uh, don't just, you know, wait for a Sunday uh, to look at that little snippet that we're looking at. Read, um, read and get to know the whole uh, letter, the whole book. It's going to give you a much uh, better viewpoint of, of what is happening and, uh, and what we're discussing. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, You can develop joy by just enjoying God's creation, whether it is going on hikes. Uh, Just uh, just on Wednesday, I I went on a bike ride with uh, Mark Shim, he and I, enjoying one another, enjoying our bodies, enjoying nature, uh, enjoying God's creation uh, is a way to develop joy. Uh, And lastly, you can pray on your own. Pray. Uh, One of the the, the greatest joys in my life is to begin the day with Jesus, to wake up every morning and, and, and declare to myself and to God and affirm that I belong to Him and uh, that He would keep my feet from evil 
and that my thoughts and my actions and my words today would reflect the character and priorities of Jesus and that he would keep me in step with his spirit. I pray that every morning and that uh, it's just, it, it begins my day off with, with joy in Christ. And so there's a secret to experiencing uh, abiding joy in Christ. And it's simply this, that Christian joy needs to be cultivated. Christian joy needs to be cultivated. Now, we see this in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, in the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Uh, these things need to be developed. These characteristics, these attributes can be ever increasing. They can grow in the life of the believer. But as we are refined, as we are sanctified, these attributes need to be cultivated. Joy needs to be cultivated. We see it also in James chapter 1, verse 2, that he says, um, when you suffer, um, when you, have, uh, when you suffer trials, like um, experience joy as you suffer trials of many, uh, of many kinds. Count it all joy, he says, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And so we see that joy, of course, in our experience, it's not something that just happens naturally. Joy, especially when it comes to trials and tribulations, it doesn't just happen naturally. It is an active orientation towards and a practice of things that bring joy. It takes cultivation. So try some of those things that I listed. Um, if you didn't get a chance to jot them down, go back later on and you can watch it again on YouTube. I uh, jot some of those things down. Uh, try some of those things that I listed. For me, I found that one of the things that brought me great joy uh, in the midst of resting in Christ was really to write sermons. I remember once when I was overseas and I finally had some time to myself, I hold myself up in a friend's apartment who was uh, out of the country, uh, and I began to read the Bible, and I just began to to write out sermon outlines because that was what was you know pointing me towards Jesus and bringing that Christian joy into my life. Um, go ahead and make up your own list and go and do them. Things that bring you joy. Now today we'll be looking at Paul's commendation of Timothy uh, and Epaphroditus. This is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. So if you have your Bibles, um, turn to them or um, go to your app and uh, you know, get to that point in, in the Word. Uh, and we are going to read it together later on. But uh, we are looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. So again, uh, this is Paul's commendation of Timothy and Epaphroditus. And if you remember from last week, they are partners with Paul in the gospel. Uh, they work together with him in gospel partnership, and there is joy in gospel partnership, like we talked about last week. So Paul, you'll see, describes Timothy as like a son to him, and Epaphroditus, he calls him a co-worker, a fellow soldier, a brother. Now, these descriptions really speak to the closeness of their relationship, of, of Paul's relationship to Timothy, of Paul's relationship to Epaphroditus. It speaks to the closeness of their relationship, and it speaks to the heart of their mission. Now, we're going to split this section into two. We're going to look at 19 to 24 and then 25 to 30. The first part talks about Timothy, and the second part talks about Epaphroditus. And if you zero in on the first part, when it talks about Timothy, you will see that there is a theme of serving others. And if you look at the Epaphroditus section, there's a theme of Christian fellowship. And so in keeping with the theme of our sermon series, we are going to look at what it is to have joy in serving others and joy in Christian fellowship. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your love and your kindness to us that in Christ we can have joy and that we can cultivate and develop this joy. So Lord, continue to work in our hearts, continue to draw us nearer to yourself and to Christ. Holy Spirit, would you do the work of refining and sanctifying us, conforming us more into the image of Jesus Christ, God's Son. We look to you now and we trust you, Lord, to do your transforming work in our hearts. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to know you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first point then is there is joy in serving others. And this comes from 
Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 24. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn to it. You can read it together with me. Um, it's also in, on the screen behind me. And this is from the English Standard Version. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How is a son with a father? He has served with me in the gospel. So I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So here you have Timothy being, and, and Paul together. And Paul is talking about Timothy. Now, um, he is with Timothy when this letter is being written. We see this in uh, t- uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. This letter comes from both of them. Now, remember that Paul is still incarcerated in Rome as he writes this letter. So Timothy's with him. Uh, Epaphroditus is actually with him too. And Epaphroditus is, Epaphroditus is actually going to be the courier of this letter back to the church in Philippi. And we're going to get to that when we get to um, the latter part of this section here. Now, what you need to know about Timothy is that Timothy is Paul's most valued teammate in his apostolic ministry. Paul really plucked uh, Timothy out of obscurity. When he was a teenager, he, uh, from, from his grandmother's uh, Lydia's household, and uh, developed him and mentored him and guided him. And Timothy, uh, so much so, became as a son to Paul. Paul writes how Timothy is as a son with a father to him. Now, this is even more explicit in 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy, the, the letters that Paul wrote directly to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1 2, he calls Timothy my true child in the faith. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he calls him my beloved child. So this father-son relationship is very, um, very real, important to, to Paul and to Timothy. And if you look at chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your, the Philippians, welfare. Paul has no one like Timothy. Now, the Greek translation could could, um, literally say, I have no one equal in soul, meaning I have no other kindred spirit like him. Nobody else knows your need like Timothy, like I do. And so um, Paul and Timothy share the same unselfish sympathy and love for the, the Philippians. The same way that Paul feels towards the Philippians, having established that church, with the joy with which he writes Philippians to them, uh, he and Timothy feel the same thing. Now, Paul writes this letter to the Philippians because he himself cannot physically be in Philippi, though he yearns to be for their sake. Remember when we looked at uh, last weekend in, in, in chapter 1, um, how he, he holds them in his heart, how he yearns for them with the affection of Christ. Paul would love to be with them, but because he can't, he writes this letter to them. And why does he write it? He says, for their progress and joy in the faith. We see that in chapter 1, verse 25. And, and not only that, he also prays for them. He prays, as Jerry told us in week one, he says he prays this life-transforming growth in God's love for them. But it's actually safe to assume, you know, we have a number of Paul's letters, of Paul's epistles to the churches. But from what we know of Paul, he would have written many, many other letters. There are other letters to the churches that may not have made it into the canon, may not have made it to us. Um, but he would have written personal letters to people who w- we would not know about. Because that's just the kind of p- guy Paul is. Paul sits in prison and he's awaiting the outcome of his trial. Uh, Will he live? Will he die? But he has these multiple troubles of his own, yet he writes out of a heart of love. He writes out of a heart of care, and he writes out of a heart of concern. Paul is looking to the interests of the Philippians. 
Now, if you remember in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul exhorts the Philippians to look not only to their own interest, but look also to the interest of others. He exhorts the Philippians to look to the interest of others. Now, this is followed, of course, by the description of Christ's humility that he took the form of a servant. If you will recall, Philippians 2, 6 to 7, who, being Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. Jesus went from the highest place to the lowest place. Jesus went from the throne room in heaven to the scullery of earth. Now, you and I know that a servant's task is to lay aside your own interest to look after the interest of others. This is the definition of what it means to be a servant. And we know uh, from Jesus um, from, from the words of Matthew and in, in other parts of the Synoptic Gospel, Matthew 20, 28 says this, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He came to be a servant. Now, Paul, in a number of his letters, refers to himself in the opening lines as the same thing, as a servant. He says, Paul, a servant of God. You find this in the letter to Titus. He calls himself, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus in Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus uh, in Galatians. Now, the Greek word used here and prevalent in the New Testament is the word doulos. Doulos is the word for servant, uh, and is, it is one who is solely committed to another. So a servant is one who is solely committed to another. Unsurprisingly, this word can also be translated as slave in other places. Now, Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, and he writes it in service to them. He writes this letter with their best interest in mind. And do you remember last week when we, told, uh, we talked about Paul's description of his life being a libation, being a liquid sacrifice upon the sacrificial offering of the Philippians. You remember that? If you don't, it's no problem. You can go to our YouTube channel and you can watch it again. Or if you missed it, you can go ahead and go and watch it because it was a great sermon. Um, so Paul describes his life as being a libation that's poured out upon the sacrificial offering of the Philippians. He puts himself in the subordinate position like a servant would, and he did it joyfully. You might say that Paul rejoiced exceedingly with great joy over the Philippians. Paul experienced joy in serving others. Now, for those of you who have been given, who have given sacrificially of yourself in service to others, I'm sure that you felt that way too. You have felt, and you you have felt joy when it comes to serving others. Uh, two of my kids, Karis, who's 17, uh, Christian, who's 13 and was an LIT, uh, they're fresh off of camp that just happened, and they would come home, and they would share about the joy that they felt when interacting with the kids and loving on them. Now, to be fair, you know, it wasn't all rainbows and unicorns. You know, most of the time, they would come home, and they would just conk out because it was just so exhausting. But sharing the love of Jesus with the campers really brought joy to my kids. And you probably have felt, again, the same way in the way that you have served others, bringing joy into your life. Now, as we've been in the midst of this pandemic and COVID has kept us all home, maybe you've been missing that aspect of your life. You used to have more avenues to serve others, and you've maybe even forgotten the joy that it brings to do just that. So let me remind you, we are now in the midst of our regathering plans, and we are going to need all hands on deck to serve. So you want to get up and sign up to serve and bring some joy into your lives. So there is joy in serving others. And the next point is that there is joy in Christian fellowship. There is joy in Christian fellowship. We see this in chapter 2, verses 25 to 30, where... Um, where Paul talks about Epaphroditus. 
And he goes on to say, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and he has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now, this is the only place in the Bible that we encounter uh, the person Epaphroditus, uh, other than the, the end of Philippians in chapter 4, verse 18, uh, when it talks about Epaphroditus being the messenger and being the bearer of this gift that the Philippians have for Paul. Now, we learn that Epaphroditus was the courier of the Philippians' financial gift to Paul, and that he was tasked also to stay with Paul while he was in prison in order to minister to his needs. So Epaphroditus is not an unknown entity. He is a known person. He is one of their own. He is known by the Philippians. And not only that, he's been entrusted with this important task not only of transporting this sum of money to Paul for his need, but as well as embodying the love and care for, uh, that, that the Philippians had for the apostle. Uh, Paul, uh, who had established the gospel in their midst through so much of uh, hardship and his own selflessness, and so they love Paul, and they are sending Epaphroditus to be their emissary, to be their messenger, their representative, their ambassador. He is to be to Paul everything the Philippians cannot be to him because they're not with him in person. But more simply than just being a messenger and a courier to the Philippians, Paul describes Epaphroditus as his fellow worker. Now, this description of fellow workers is simply an, an active partner in ministry. You remember in other parts of Philippians, he talks about working side by side. So this is what it means, that Epaphroditus is a fellow worker in the, in the ministry of the gospel with Paul. He is a partner with Paul in gospel ministry. He is a fellow worker. He also calls him a fellow soldier. Paul is a, uh, Epaphroditus is Paul's fellow soldier. So this, of course, is a military term, simply meaning a comrade in arms. Uh, so Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus is Paul's comrade in arms. And you see that in other parts of Paul's writing, he uses military imagery uh, to, uh, for his work in conditions of adversity. So when things are not going well, he'll sometimes use military imagery. So we can see this in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He talks about it in that way. And so what he's saying about Epaphroditus is that Epaphroditus has had his commitment tested in the face of genuine conflict. And we know this because we know that Epaphroditus came close to death in his mission to minister to Paul. So Epaphroditus is a fellow soldier in the work uh, and in partnership with Paul. But lastly, he calls him a brother. Paul calls Epaphroditus his brother. And so there's a familiar relationship here that can describe, of course, just fellow Christians in general. But I believe in the context of Philippians, this letter, and the fact that Epaphroditus is with him right there uh, as he's writing it, um, Paul is just meaning it in a, in a much more personal way. He means it, that, that here is his brother. Paul has had some deep fellowship with Epaphroditus, again, who was entrusted with the work of ministering to Paul uh, in their time together. And so the joy with which Paul writes to the Philippians is, is, is experienced in part uh, from his fellowship with Epaphroditus. And to that point, I would make that there is joy in Christian Fellowship. There is joy in Christian fellowship. Now, this word fellowship 
in Greek is simply a koinonia. It doesn't happen in this verse, but it does happen in quite a few places in the New Testament. Uh, koinonia simply meaning life together with other believers uh, in unity and participating in God's gospel work. Life together with other believers in unity and participating in God's gospel work. Now, we see this in the life of the early church in Acts 2, 42, where it says, And they devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And so, fellowship with other believers was a high value in the early church, in the life of the believers back in Paul's day. And so, Paul talks about Epaphroditus as his brother. Paul talks about Timothy as his son. So both of these men were more than simply partners. They were more than just co-laborers. They were more than comrades. They were family. And Paul enjoyed fellowship with them in the context of being in God's family. Now there's this beautiful picture in Mark, uh, in Mark chapter 3, Verses 31 to 35. Uh, I'll read it to you here. It says, um, it says this and it starts. Uh, and his mother, that being Jesus, and his mother and his brothers came. And standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, Jesus is deep in his earthly ministry of teaching and healing. The crowds are gathered at his feet. And his brother and his mother, his brothers and his mother, they come a knocking. They come calling upon him. Now, I don't know what happened in that scenario, but every time I read this response from Jesus, I just, I just have a chuckle. I, I imagine, you know, his mother and his brothers are coming. They see him from apar, afar. They're like trying to get his attention. They're like waving at him. Jesus is like oblivious, doesn't even know they're there, or maybe he, he's ignoring them. So they send someone to say, hey, by the way, your mother and your brothers are outside. They're, uh, they're wanting to get your attention. They're wanting to come and see you. And Jesus, what does he do? He doesn't say, oh yeah, I'd love to go see them. He says, and he turns to the crowd. He looks at them and he says, who are my mother and my brothers? I know, I mean, it sounds petty and it sounds a little, you know, passive aggressive. But I mean, just remember, Jesus didn't have uh, an evil bone in his body, okay? He, 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 he had no guile and he didn't mean it that way. What he meant was this. He casts his gaze about those who are sitting around him. And he says, here, here, those of you who are right here, you are my mother and my brothers. You are my family. If you do the will of God, you are my brother and my sister and my mother. This creative look that Jesus of casts upon the people that are seated at his feet. It, it is almost like it, this is bringing the eschatological family of God into being. Listen to the words of Isaiah, uh, chapter 60, verse 4. Um, Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Remember Isaiah, so much prophecy about Christ there. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar. Your daughters shall be carried on your hip. There's this sense that, sense that as, as Jesus casts his creative gaze upon the crowd that is uh, gathered around him, he is calling into being this new family in God, Jews and Gentiles, like those who would do the will of the Father, those who walk in obedience to him. Now, of course, we belong to God's family when he adopts us as his children, when we confess Jesus as Savior and as Lord. But when we confess him as Lord, we are proclaiming to the world that we will walk in obedience to him. And so Jesus ties belonging to God's family with obedience, doing the will of God. 
And if you remember when we talked about last week, in our obedience, God takes pleasure in our participation in his purposes. I love how all this stuff just comes together. Beautiful thing. God takes pleasure in our participation in his purposes. This obedience pulls us and draws us into his family. Now, Epaphroditus, he's with Paul, and he's with, with Paul now for a while. He went on his journey, got sick, almost died, continued on his journey, made it to Paul, gave him his financial gift, and has been ministering to Paul. And Paul probably likewise ministering to him. But Epaphroditus longs to be reunited in fellowship with his fellow Philippians, with his church family. Now, we'll never really know the circumstances leading to Epaphroditus' deathly illness. We won't even know for sure what that deathly illness was. But what we do know is that he did not travel alone, especially while carrying such a valuable gift. He wouldn't have gone it by himself. It would have been an entourage of some sort. Uh, and had, and if he, because he became ill on the journey, a member of that traveling party would have been dispatched back to Philippi to let them know of this little hiccup in their plans. Um, just so they've been kept abreast of it. But having recovered, Epaphroditus then would have continued on his mission to reach Paul as quickly as he can with this monetary gift to support Paul while he's in prison. And of course, the gift of himself, the gift of ministering to Paul and fellowshipping with Paul. Now, the Philippians may not have received news of Epaphroditus' completion of this assigned task as his envoy. So Paul in his concern for the Philippians, and also in his concern for Epaphroditus' distress over leaving his church family in the dark about his health, decides it's necessary, as we saw in chapter 2, verse 25, it is necessary to send Epaphroditus back to them, and in all likelihood, with the letter to the Philippians in hand, so that Epaphroditus and the Philippians can enjoy fellowship with one another again. So Epaphroditus can enjoy fellowship with his church family. Now, Jerry always describes Summit Community Church as a family. We're a family. Now, many of you experienced that firsthand when you stepped foot into Richmond Green for that first time, or maybe before the time of Richmond Green, however it is that you came in contact with Summit Community Church for the first time. And you would have experienced the friendliness, the welcome, the love, and maybe even felt like you were at home. Because that's what's most frequently described to me when I've met you, when I finally have had the chance to meet you in person and ask some of you how you came to Summit Church uh, as your church home. And really, I felt the same way in the past few weeks, getting to finally, again, to meet some of you in person. It's been a joy-filled experience of, of fellowship, of breaking bread together, of praying together. Now, understand this. I, uh, by nature, am an introvert. And what that just means is that I am energized. Uh, I... Uh, I find it sucks energy out of me when I'm around people a lot, and it's like I'm more energized when I'm alone, right? Uh, and introverts, so, I mean, what I've, I've found about that, coming to understand myself as an introvert, and some of you, you know, might be here as well, um, that there's a fine line as an introvert uh, uh, in terms of um, having, um, experiencing self-sufficiency, all right? Uh, a difference between, a, a fine line between self-sufficiency and self-absorption, okay? If you catch my meaning, all right. Uh, Self-sufficiency being, yeah, I'm okay with myself. Self-absorption being you're, you're kind of a, you know, fill in the blank. So there's, there's a fine line to that when it becomes an introvert. And so for me, I have to actively work against that part of myself. And I know that it takes a lot of intentionality and will uh, to make meeting up with people happen, especially during COVID. I mean, it was hard enough when we could physically meet together. Uh, but I mean, even harder when I had to like, you know, call someone and, and, um, create a Zoom link and say, hey, are you available at this time? Can we meet together on Zoom? Like intentionality and will is what it's, I had to force myself to really get to know people, not because I don't want to get to know people, but just, just because of my personality. But what I found is as I've been doing that and as I've been stepping out more and more and, and trying to get into Christian fellowship with people, it's been so uplifting and just so edifying to me. And remember that God created us for community. 
He created us as human beings for, crea uh, for community because we are created in our, His image. It reflects the eternal, perfect, loving communion between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we need one another as believers. We need one another. We need our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be in community for God to bring out the best in us, for God to bring to completion the good work that He's begun in us, as Paul writes to the Philippians. We need one another to know the joy in Christian fellowship. To know the joy in Christian fellowship. I love this passage in uh, Philippians where he talks about Timothy and Epaphroditus because it really wasn't until this reading that all of this started to come out to me and I feel it's just such a beautiful thing, this, this joy uh, in Christian fellowship and uh, um, to, to, to be able to experience that with one another and, and the joy that comes in serving others and how those two things go hand in hand. So let me leave you with this. If you are not part of a life group, if you're not in a young adult ministry, if you're in that age category, if you're not in the men's or women's or the 55 plus ministry, uh, go to our website, all right? Get plugged in, um, find a group, find community, find someone to fellowship with uh, because you will be so blessed by it and then you will experience the joy of it. Um, and if you are not serving and you want to serve, you want to get involved, just uh, email info at summitcommunity.ca uh, and we'll, we'll get you plugged in. We'll get you serving. And you will, go, you will get that much needed joy from serving and being with other believers. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we're just, again, grateful for your word, uh, grateful for the beauty of what is there as it, uh, as it comes out to us and it speaks to us. God, I pray that your word um, just went forth uh, and is not going to return to you void, Lord. You promised that it won't return to you void. And as we, God, continue to follow you, as we continue uh, to live our lives uh, for Christ and, uh, and desire to draw near to you, desire to be uh, conformed more to the image of your Son, to become more like him, uh, to have his mind, as we've heard also in the book of Philippians. God, I pray that you would be gracious and merciful to us uh, and that you would meet us where we are in that desire. Um, we pray that you would just continue to minister to us, uh, help us to be attentive to what you are doing around us, whether it is uh, to join uh, where you are working, to be serving others, to be in Christ Christian fellowship, Lord, um, so that we can exalt your name and, and lift your name on high, but also experience the joy that comes with it that you promise us as well. And so we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I give my whole life to honor this love by the Lamb who was slain. I'm forgiven the sinner's sin
Summit family, this week is communion and we have the honor to come to the altar of grace with our hearts wide open in communion together as one church in Christ. And this is a sacred moment where we come to the Lord's table with our hearts wide open and yet broken before him in remembrance of all that he has done. And in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, we remember what God the Father has done by sending forth Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the perfect sacrifice for all of our sins. So let us take this time to gather our communion elements, whatever you have available at home. Essentially, it symbolizes Christ's body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us. And just before we approach the Lord, it is important to examine ourselves. So take this moment silently in the stillness of his presence to confess, to repent of any sins that you know of or perhaps that you do not know of and to come to his throne of grace with a heart wide open to receive afresh the freedom of forgiveness that we already have in Jesus Christ. So let us take this moment right now before we pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this day to give thanks, to give praise, to remember your sacrificial love at the cross. We thank you for sending forth your Son who was pierced for our transgressions, who carried our iniquities, a man of sorrow and our suffering servant who bore all of our sins. And we thank you that you remember them no more. We thank you for the freedom of forgiveness that we can come into your presence with our hearts wide open to worship you, to honor you, and to remember all that you have done by sending forth your Son. So we thank you for the spirit of grace, and we thank you for your sacrificial and unconditional love. So Father, come and fill us afresh and, and remind us of your goodness and your grace and even the severity of your mercy as we come to the foot of the cross to lay down our sins before you, knowing that in you we have true life and liberty. Father, thank you for this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul, as he was led by the Spirit, said, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, and after supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Summit family, we remember this day that every time that we take of this bread and every time that we drink of this cup, in the spirit of Christ, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance towards you and grant you peace. Well, friends, it's been wonderful worshiping with you today and uh, the joy that it brings me to be able to preach the word as well. I want to leave you with this uh, doxology from the book of Jude. And he ends his letter saying this, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with 
great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. We love you, church, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you for being with us today. Our service will be posted here on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on anything. And don't forget to like this video. You should also follow us on Facebook and Instagram for all the latest updates. It has been my privilege to serve you guys at Summit. I will miss you. Have a great week, church. We love you.